Hello and welcome to the Musical Instrument Investigator. Today we have a, another exciting video of our hunting series where we kind of pick a specific maker and try and find um, kind of violins or other instruments by this maker that are for sale. Uh, and today we are searching for uh, violins by Pietro Antonio Dalla Costa, an interesting uh, Italian violin maker active in the 18th century. And with me today on this magical adventure, uh, I have uh, Max, uh, my um, kind of uh, partner in crime. Hello, Max. Hello. How are you doing? Are you looking forward to searching for some Pietro Antonio Della Costa violins? Oh, absolutely. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Excellent. So I've been, I've cheated a little bit because I've already kind of gone ahead and found um, a few, probably the only ones that I could find so far, but I think it gives a good overview. So we have three full-size violins, we have a seven eights, and we also have an interesting composite. So that should be quite good. Um, so before we kind of crack on, I'm just gonna give a quick kind of overview of the maker. So this is a bit of a kind of more obscure maker, a rarer maker. Uh, I think his exact kind of um, date of birth and potentially death is not known, but I believe it's something like circa 1697 to uh, 1770. And here we've kind of, uh, we're stealing some information from Ingalls and Heyday website here. Uh, they don't have one for sale, but we're just stealing their information. So he was a significant maker of the Venetian school, although he was born in Alba, which is a fair way away from uh, Venice and active basically in Treviso, which is just above Venice between 1720 and 1768. Apparently Mozart owned a violin of his um, and they have a characteristic of the Baroque style. And I think um, Dalla Costa was basically a follower of the Amati kind of style, as they say, he acknowledged on his label at some times. Uh, workmanship is delicate and uh, it's kind of quite fine finishing that kind of Venetian style. Um, just to kind of... Um, and give you a bit of kind of context of what we're talking about here. So Alba is kind of over here. So it's a bit further over, um, kind of nearer Turin and Genoa. And then obviously we have Venice here and then we have uh, Treviso a bit higher. So he was basically spent most of his kind of violin making life in Treviso. Uh, it's a very interesting maker um, and definitely worth kind of looking to kind of uh, hold one in person play one if you uh, if you get the opportunity to um i have uh seen and held one example in person before uh max have you seen or held one or played one before uh i have not okay but now i might as well be uh keeping my keeping an eye out for one yeah exactly yeah i definitely would and i i think they are very kind of um interesting violins an interesting maker like i said quite fairly rare not not so insane that they don't come up for auction or not available for sale obviously we've got a few examples here but they are fairly rare um so without kind of rabbiting on too much uh, let's look at the first one that we have here and max who's a bit more knowledgeable about violins from a playing point of view um will kind of give a good his opinion on on these different ones so here we have um, a violin by Della Costa, circa 1760. Uh, length of back is 35.4. This is for sale on uh, Florian Leonhard's um, uh, shop, which is based in, in London in the UK. Yeah. What um, do you think of uh, this particular example, Max? Did you mention uh, about how much the maker is go going for currently? Oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, so... Um, I believe the auction record for this on Teresio for this maker is about $100,000, but obviously you'd expect to pay a bit more uh, than that at retail. So you're probably looking somewhere between one hundred dollars to $150,000 for like a good solid example without anything kind of dodgy going on. So it should be around that cost. You might pay a bit less if there's some kind of condition issues or as you'll see later on, a composite or a seven eighth will be a bit lower, but I would expect that you'd probably be paying somewhere between a hundred and hundred fifty thousand dollars, maybe even potentially a bit more for a really fine example. Um, it's yeah, it's it's hard to say exactly uh, what the market is at the moment. So, 
So um, the one on Flora and Leonhardt, uh, at least from what I can see, um, the F holes are uh, clearly uh, inspired by the Amati school. But although the F hole placement is actually slightly higher than what you expect from a classical Italian instrument, so slightly higher on the 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 ice, which is um, something you will see in some of the, uh, the Guarneri family works. But obviously the the F holes are very different from the Guarneri school. Um, just a interesting fact. Um, but the, the overall form is actually quite a departure from the the classical Amati form. This one's significantly wider. Um, so which which uh, is is curious because you know Venice uh, not only well, I know this is not Venice, but I know the the <laughs> the Dalla Costa has a strong tie to Venice. So you know Venice is a melting pot. That's when you start seeing influences from just about anywhere. Um, you know, I, I think previously mentioned that uh, Dalla Costa uses uh, a Venetian varnish, which you know it was there was a lot of red pigment in it, and over time it kind of turned into a bit of a brown black color. Um, I I suspect that the little dark tint you see around the sea bell is what's left over from the varnish and underneath is the, your, your typical golden Italian ground. So this is uh, quite typical of, uh, of many Venetian instruments that I've seen. I've seen, a, I think a Gofila or some of the Montagnana has very similar varnish to this. Yeah, and, and the one on foreign, I think is a pretty typical and very fine example. Um, one piece back and the it seems to me like most, at least a couple of the examples I've seen from this maker that um, he, he used a purfling that's pretty standard to the Italians, um, maple purfling, not too wide, not too thin, and locator pins. This could be, you know, an influence like from the, the, the Cremoni school. Well, as you know, that this maker followed even in Florence's website, he said he, he was inspired by the brothers of Matis. So you can mm -hmm. definitely see that influence here. Well, yeah. unfortunately, I can't see the scroll here. Yeah, it's a shame that we don't have a side profile of the scroll. Um, it does say in some kind of biographies for him that he may have actually worked in Venice and also Mantua, but I don't think that's confirmed. But, yeah. I mean, Treviso is so close to Venice anyway. Um, so I think we can assume that definitely a strong kind of Venetian uh, influence. Yeah, it's funny reading the... Um... The, the description they uh, they did mention about the the interesting patterns uh, they they referred to as the grand pattern I don't think this is exactly the same as the Amati's grand pattern but I'm not too sure I mean because this this is definitely a lot more squarish than the Amati's but it could be also it could also be a photography that's messing things up here yeah yeah and it also mentioned that this one has been altered around the F holes um, right you, okay yeah. You kind of tell where where that happened because the pictures are not that good. Yeah, it's uh, it looks maybe towards like the the end, mm -hmm. like the the lower kind of part. The okay. varnish looks a bit kind of retouched, a bit of a different color. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if they've been kind of repaired, yeah. and possibly cool. the top right as well. Uh, it is difficult to say really with these pictures. Yeah, I guess, yeah, like, um, if I could mark something up here. Well, I don't think I could, but yeah, the, the near the top wing of the, the, the uh, trouble side F-holes, the F-hole, there may have been some you know, grafting going on, and the, the large eye could also be the result of the uh, F-hole alteration. Mm. Yeah. I think we mentioned in some of our older auction videos that uh, this is quite common, but some of the... Some of the instruments we've seen, it, it was so messed up that it's, it's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> but this one yeah. is actually pretty elegant, whatever it's, been, whatever it's been done on it. Yeah. But this isn't isn't too bad, I think, on the yeah. face of it anyway. Yeah. Well, debatable if that actually does anything to the sound. So in case you, if you actually own a, a valuable classical instrument, just do me a favor. Just don't touch the F-hole. Yeah. Don't, don't touch it. Yeah, exactly. And we can see it's quite an interesting scroll as well. Yeah. The the peg box though, it, it does look the walls of the peg box does look quite thick. I, I don't know if it's a mm. photography issue or you can see yeah. that 
strings are like even touching the inside because this is definitely because you know the inside of the pack box is is a it's a grafting job so i don't know if um hmm. if the, maybe they did something uh with the the graph uh, during the grafting that they left the wall really thick because you can see the g and the e string is like touching it <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah that is definitely a bit uh, interesting um should we move on to the next one uh, sure, yeah. Uh, and uh, just a couple ending notes. I think this one has also been very well played. You can see the corners have already been have all been worn down. So I assume this is probably one of, some, one of those, uh, you know, performing instruments. So mm. I wouldn't be surprised if this one sounds really good, but <laughs> got to try it. Yeah, you'll have to try it when you uh, come to London if it's still available. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so moving on. We have another Dada Costa, obviously, because <laughs> this is what the video is about, um, from uh, Treviso 1749. Um, so, yeah, um, we've got the same kind of information here. So, 1770 death. Um, they're giving 1696 as a kind of earlier date. I think that might be a bit... Uh, that's a little bit earlier than the date I gave previously. I think they don't know exactly so and then it mentions here about the mo the violin for mozart so it says this pure and splendid example bears an original label together with the maker's signature inscription on the wood alongside it and even that well look at this this is what five two hundred fifty thousand to five hundred thousand that's the, the wow price okay that. yeah it makes sense for something like this so i mean just this is how how much more you could be paying for a fine example in, in private sale, in compared in comparison to some dodgy stuff on auctions. So yeah, I mean this this does actually look amazing. This one though, yes, you see this one is made ten years before the example we saw in Florian Lillard. Um, yeah, and this one is a lot closer to it, uh, uh, the Brothers of Mafia style. From the the F hole placement is identical to where the criminals will put their F holes. The form is very Amati-ish. Um, the back, um, the, the way that the pens are made. Um, well, you can also see the scroll for this one, and you can see that the scroll definitely um, has more personal touch into it. But the body has, you can see that strong Brothers Amati influence. In mm. The scroll is um, quite beautiful, actually. I really like it. It's a shame that the pictures, you can't really zoom in on the front view to see the front of the scroll because it's quite an interesting scroll as well from the front. Yeah, well, you can always fly to Boston and see this in person. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, yeah, there's more. You could probably play this one a bit easier than the one at Florian's. But, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this this is very beautiful. I prefer this one already, I think. Well, some people do prefer the, the, the fatter um, form because some of them... Um, some people, some players do believe that they will sound better, which in, in a way is, is true because people definitely be, uh, prefer the Strada and Guadini form, which is much wider than the Del Monte. Mm. But obviously, that's, that all depends on a lot of other factors. Yeah. yeah. So th this is a good example of how prices can vary so much. Obviously, we don't know how much the Florian one is. But mm -hmm. like, as we're seeing here, the, at minimum, it's got to be 250000 which is way over what I was stating. But I think that if you we look at some of the other prices, which are things which are pay, m maybe not in the greatest condition, I think the truth is somewhere in the middle, really. So I think this is probably an exception rather than the rule. But I mean, I could be wrong. Prices are kind of escalating so much recently that it is difficult to really keep track of what's uh what's occurring geez this one has you know the original label in it, which is... uh, yeah exactly i mean and an inscription so th this is pretty pretty rare i mean i think that there was a dalla costa for seller ingles in heyday last year wasn't there or even bromptons or something like that i can't remember and i don't yeah i don't know if it was hitting prices near this i don't think so um, I think it was more near 80,000, 100,000 or so or something like that. But I, I really forget, to be honest. Yeah, which makes sense, you know. Auction is a quick sale and sometimes depending on the condition. Um, yeah, if, uh, I mean, unfortunately, no mention of the, the, the back length of this one. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's like identical to the Marty, which will be, you know, 355, 
yeah six or so so it's yeah. going to be a comfortable uh, size anyway yeah i do suspect this one had a, a darker varnish on it the venetian varnish on it similar to the florian example because you can see there there there's some varnish leftovers and but i can't say that for sure because some of the other uh, you know uh, golden varnish violin also has these um, le leftover residues around the belts and uh, in the middle of the front but, but you know I, I, if the, the thing in the middle which were a lot of uh, rosin dust what I've been collecting there seems to be some red varnish that's left there but I'm not too sure if that's just the resin or that could be the uh, leftover varnish Yep. It's the, the Venetian varnish essentially was a pigmented red varnish that over time turned dark. So I wouldn't be surprised if this one had a, a very nice red varnish on it. Mm -hmm. um, shall we move on or any further thoughts on this particular one? I, I think I, I would have made more comments if <laughs> there are better pictures. But... Yeah, unfortunately, uh, yeah. we can't zoom in so much on this one. I mean, but, so. at least from what I can see, I think this one is in slightly better condition. You can see the corner works are yeah. uh, slightly clearer than the previous one. Yep, I agree. Okay, so moving on to the last one of the full size, which is supposedly kind of mostly original. Uh, we're here on the website of Frederick W. Oster Fine Violins. Um, so this is a, another Della Costa from 1760. Uh, and this is in the 35 to 55,000 uh, uh, bracket. Oh, sorry, I've actually got it around the wrong way. This is the 7 8th. So um, this gives you an idea that the bracket here is a, a bit different. And we've got at least quite a few different um, kind of images on this one. Uh, looks like, uh, see, length of back 340, so it's quite quite short, and it looks like uh, it's potentially not in the greatest of conditions, this yeah. one. This one seems you know, pretty rough, roughly made, a lot of dodgy work's done on it. I don't know if the, the varnish is even original, actually. This is a bit of an interesting question, because you, you, you see some of the Italian, Italian examples having a lot of leftover varnish, especially on like the basses and cellos. But they also have these like Italian instruments with just clean uh, golden varnish on it. So you, you, it's hard to know if it's hard to tell if it's restoration that put that put the other ones in the that mint condition. You know, if this is how it's supposed to look. Exactly. Well, you do you do wonder if actually this might be truer to what the color should be. Yeah. But Which, it does look a little bit odd, though. Yeah. Hard to tell, because especially for a fractional instrument, you know, they're they're typically not made at, a stand, at the same standard as the full-size ones. Interesting uh, scroll there. Yeah. So, yeah, this one is uh, considerably cheaper uh obviously you can see that uh it's not quite the same condition it'd be interesting to see what the condition report is for this because i feel that there might be a few issues with this one if you click on it i think you can also uh i think you can get a, a larger picture yeah uh you can see the buttons being replaced doesn't it that's at least one thing although well uh that's very common though i i'm pretty sure even the previous two examples the buttons have been replaced but they've been well replaced enough that you wouldn't tell. You yeah. Wouldn't be, yeah. I think almost all, um, almost all 18th century Italian instruments I've seen have the buttons replaced at some point. Okay. Um, any further thoughts on this one? Uh, or if you look at the scroll and if you compare it with uh, the the ruining example, they're actually very similar, which makes sense. Okay, they're by the same maker, but you you kind of kind of get an idea for the the dollar code the scroll looks like yeah let me just see if i can put these uh next to each other a bit more yeah you can definitely see some of the similarities just the varnish color obviously vastly different yeah so okay um any further comments uh not not anymore I think <laughs> it's an interesting example. Yeah, definitely. And a bit uh, more reasonable price. 
Uh, so now we're going to the actual last uh, full size one. I've uh, kind of got a bit muddled up here. So we're on Tokyo Strings uh, website in Japan, and they have a 1740s Della Costa with a length of back of 358, which is actually quite long. Yeah. Uh, you can, yeah, you can also. Uh, you, you can also you can open all the pictures uh, and tap into tabs but oh that's fine i guess <laughs> yeah but they do have pretty good pictures um it's quite interesting how different the lower f hole wings are on this one to the other examples because the other it, examples they're very fine but yeah. they're quite chunky on this example it makes you wonder because the other ones are you know obviously very um, amati-ish uh, F holes. This one almost went, you know, Guarneri or Strad, you mm. know, these big uh, F hole wings. It, it makes you wonder if you know these have been modified or I mean the wood grains do align. So yeah. And this one had you know the at least the left side corners very well preserved. Yeah, this one is interesting. It makes you wonder like what has it been through, you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and what's even funnier is if you can, if you go to the front, yeah, the left side of the wood, you know, has significantly wider grain than the right side. Right. Okay. Yeah. You know, this there could be you know from the same from a piece of really weird tree, you know, it could be a, a one piece front, which I don't think it is because it looks like it has been joined in the middle. So it could be from two different pieces of wood, which I mean, you've seen Strauss doing that. Yeah, this this is weird. This is this is almost like, you know, Niccolo Ma, like late. And not even that. It's like Strad influence. Uh, well, this is the seventeen forty, which which makes sense. You know, the Venetians do this all the time. You know, they have a, a Strad or a, a, a Bergonzi on their bench, and they they start copying it. Because you know, even the the form, uh, it's hard to tell because of the photography. But the, even the form looks like it could also you know it could even be a little more. Jeez, look at that scroll. That looks even the scroll looks different, you know. Yeah. I used to wonder if this is actually a set of Safin instead of a Dal Costa. Right, okay, yeah. Yeah, right. We've seen Safins that look more like this. Than, and this one's also longer too, it's a 358. Yeah. Be interesting to see what certificate or anything is with this. Yeah. Definitely well, a curious one. No information here. <laughs> no. Let's see. Yeah, the purflings are very nice on this one. The corners. And you can see quite a bit of uh, leftover varnish on this one. Mm. And there seems to be one uh, crack on the front. Uh, that's that's a crack from pressure from, from the um, the chin rest. That's oh, yeah. Really <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah. It's definitely not as, you know... Uh, over repaired as some of the other ones yeah i think i really like the back but i find the front not particularly appealing um yeah. i mean some something something happened to it i guess yeah, yeah exactly there's something funny going on for sure uh any further comments on this one or should we move on to the last uh one um i think we got this one covered looks okay. nice i mean that's about all, all we could say the scroll definitely looks uh, slightly off mm. uh, but you know of course you know it's you know, over the lifetime of a luthier they, they they change things around exactly okay well let's go on to the final one which i think is actually quite curious um because we are on the website of bishops which are based in the uk uh, i think in london uh, and we've got a composite Dalla Costa uh, circa 1760 for the back, the ribs, and I think the scroll. But the hill, um, sorry, the top has been made by the Hills Workshop in the 1980s, uh, circa 1985, they're saying here, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. Um, yeah, and you can see the price range here, 25 to 50. So that's quite low. I mean, obviously, it's a composite and the top being one of the key parts. It's uh, unfortunate that that's been uh, kind of changed. And you do wonder what condition the previous top was in, or even if the previous was original, maybe the previous top wasn't original either. But uh, it does make you wonder. The, the scroll is very interesting. It, this doesn't, 
from what I've seen of Dalek Costa, this doesn't remind me of him. This it looks a lot like um I'm trying to think what this other maker was. Mm. I mean, I think they made a fair attempt at trying to kind of copy the varnish on the front but it didn't really quite work out yeah i mean it's hard to tell with uh, the photography and everything sometimes you know even if it looks really nice in person um because you know the different varnish they have different you know way of reflecting light uh, or different ways that you know light goes through them and they bounce back that's how you get the color and reacts a little differently i mean all the, the nitty-gritty but the nitty-gritty but sometimes they do look quite different hmm. i kind of like yeah well, well we can hear a little sound sample do you want to hear a sound sample sure well I, well i start thinking what that scroll reminds me of yeah oh yeah um just a little bit yeah <laughs> scroll is that Massive eye. Yeah, maybe um, just make sure you're uh, you're actually recording the recording the sound from your your browser because I'm, I'm not hearing anything at the moment. Uh, okay, yeah, I think I should hopefully be getting a bit of it. Yeah. Anyway, we don't want to listen to too much of it. Interesting note for you actually down at the bottom here. Interesting violin, possibly one of the most beautiful violin backs I've ever seen. The top is made by Hills and Sons, circa 1995. The previous owner swapped her uh, Jean Baptiste Villon to get this violin. So, possibly, it says here, possibly not the wisest choice financially, but this violin will make someone happy now in a modest price range. Mm. Will, make, will make me happy if I can own one of them. Exactly, yeah. So it, very interesting. I have to say, I really like this varnish. Some of the hill violins do actually have varnish kind of similar kind of color to this. This is just very different to, uh, you know, the other examples we've seen. It's very luminescent. Yeah. Well, again, I think that that could just be the, the photography. Hmm. But it's definitely, definitely a curious one. This is your uh, standard uh, dealer photography in comparison to auction photography. Mm. Well, so anyway, here we have, uh, we've got, although I kind of messed up the order, uh, but we have three examples of kind of full-size violins, kind of mainly intact, a seven-eighth, uh, and then with this composite. So I think that's quite a good kind of, uh, yeah, quite a good overview. Um, do you have any kind of further comments about this maker or kind of any other things in general about any of the specific ones that we've looked at? Uh, I, I, I think I've uh, said everything that's uh, gone through my head. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'll just say to anyone that might be watching this video, um, if you see one of these instruments for sale in a shop or for sale in an auction and you have the opportunity to have a look at it to pick it up to play it i would definitely recommend it because i've seen one of these instruments in person and i have to say they're very interesting and i think as you can see obviously some of them the finer examples can be quite expensive but some of the kind of lesser examples you can get quite reasonably and i think it's an interesting maker and i yeah i think it's a, an interesting um interesting violins to kind of really investigate so that would be my uh, my recommendation yeah. So on that note, uh, I just want to say massive thanks to uh, Max for joining me on this violin, uh, on this violin, on this <laughs> video, uh, or join me on this violin as well, this violin uh, kind of adventure. Uh, I shall put a link to all of the websites uh, that we've looked at um, in the description of the video. Um, and yeah, have a look at them and see what you think. Um yeah so once again uh thanks max for everything and uh thanks to everyone uh who watched uh this video and uh basically catch you all next time ciao bye 
Many thanks for tuning in to the Musical Instrument Investigator. I hope that you enjoyed the video. If you did, then please like, uh, subscribe and turn on notifications and watch out for the next video coming soon.